Well, hello, everybody. My name is Elena G. Levine. I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions, and I'm the author of Networking for Nerds, which is a book that's being published by Wiley next month. I'm so delighted today uh, to be representing the American Geophysical Union and presenting this webinar on managing a research group. And I wanted to thank the AGU Career Center for supporting and sponsoring this type of endeavor. We have lots of webinars that we do throughout the year, and this is just one of them. Before I start the content of the webinar, a couple of housekeeping issues. If for some reason you can't see the screen, you can either adjust your viewer or log out and log back in. You can also test to see how fast your computer's running to make sure that you're getting the slides by do, going to speedtest.net. It'll tell you how quickly your Wi-Fi or your internet is working to make sure that you're getting the, um, the, the right speed for the, uh, for the viewer, for the slides. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you can simply type them in the questions console as part of the webinar uh, console that you have on your screen, and I'll be answering those as we conclude. And finally, if you don't hear me, you can also log out and log back in, or you could call in, or if, you're, if you've called in, you can try using your computer to do voice over internet. So with that in mind, I want to begin, begin our talk today about managing a research group and jump right into this whole exciting endeavor that is uh, your life as you move forward in your career which will involve being a scientist and managing a research group. And of course, when I say managing a research group, I'm specifically today talking about managing a research group within an academic scientific context. So I'm talking about becoming a faculty member. I'm talking about having a research group within a government lab or a government agency. Um, you could even extrapolate this to managing a research group within a corporate environment or a nonprofit environment where you're perhaps part of the R&D division of that particular enterprise. Um, but quite frankly, these skills and these topics that we're going to be talking about today are actually um, universal for any type of group that you would be managing. So whether you transition out, whether you stay in science and scientific research and actually manage a research group that is doing research, conducting actual research discovery and then producing papers or patents or products, or you decide to migrate out of that and do other things, maybe do marketing or communications or quality assurance or tech transfer or something else, you're going to be involved in groups. You're going to be involved in teams. And so these skills, these topics that we're going to be talking today are actually about, are actually universal across many, many different types of groups for the most part. Of course, when we talk about managing the research space and your actual instrumentation and what you need to buy and bring into your research space, it's going to be different if you were building a group associated with a marketing project, but the concepts are basically the same. So I want you to pay attention and see how you could potentially apply these ideas to multiple ecosystems throughout your career. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about how to identify and, and, and then articulate your research group's goals. You're the leader of this research group. What are your goals for the group? And how can you communicate that? I want to talk to you about how you can develop leadership skills and team building skills so that you can build a successful team and cultivate that team so the team is consistently and automatically contributing to the rest of the team's success. I'm going to talk to you about managing projects. We're going to talk about communication skills and methods and ways of thinking about communicating when we're interacting with our team members and with our other constituents that we, that we interact with. And then we're also going to be talking about managing the research space, which includes the instrumentation as well as funding sources as well. So your research group, think about why you would be establishing a research group at all, right? You have to start with the very basic idea. When you're deciding that I need a research group, and it could be a group of one, or it could be a group of 20, or it could be a group of 100. What are the goals of your research group? So first of all, as a scientist, the goal, the main goal, the main aim of any research group is to advance your research goals, to advance the research ideas that you have in your head, to, and to engage people to allow them to actually move that career, or move that uh, idea, move those goals, move that, uh, that discovery uh, notion that you have in your mind forward and into productivity. So you're going to be contributing 
to the success of your department, of your institution, of your field, and also you're going to be contributing to the success of your subordinates, the people that work for you, your students, your postdocs, um, any people who come in for internships maybe or short-term projects. So your research group is also going to serve as a training opportunity for these protégés because in science, in institutions, in academia, the research group environment is designed not just for you to advance your own mission, your own research mission, but it's designed to also encourage and encourage students and postdocs to understand how they can build their own research group and move forward in their own careers to build their own research groups later too. Don't let that get lost. Don't um, don't uh, put that off in a corner. That the that the idea that your research group, one of your main goals of your research group is to serve as this training opportunity. This is not a minor detail. This is a big thing. Because as you know, in science, in academia, it's all about training the next generation. It's all about moving forward to the next legacy, to the next generation of scientists and helping those scientists develop the skills and insight so they can be the next generation of discoverers, the next generation of innovators. And so your role in your research group is not to be, you're not to sort of, um, you know, put this off to the side and say, yeah, well, their goal is my goal. My team has to do what I tell them to do, or my team has to achieve my research goals. And that's the entire extent of their uh, reason for existence. Their reason for living is to achieve my research goals. No, they are there to achieve your research goals. That's one of your goals in establishing a research group. But, but also, equally important, you have to be paying it forward. You have to be thinking of this as a training opportunity for the next generation. Otherwise, your science will stall. When you drop dead, there will be nobody else to take on your legacy. So you have to continue this. It also gives you a chance to demonstrate and hone your own leadership capacity. Because as you build your career and as you advance in your career, you will be leading many different types of groups beyond research groups. You will be serving on committees that are devoted to service to the department, to the university, to your professional society, to your community. You'll be serving on multinational committees. You'll be serving on government committees. In all these cases, you will have to demonstrate leadership and team building and, and conflict resolution. And in doing so, what we have to do is make sure that you've been thinking about this from the very beginning, that you've actually built yourself a career where you can allow yourself opportunities to advance your leadership capacity, hone your leadership skills, and, 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 and even demonstrate that in multiple outputs. You also want to be aware in building your research group that the culture of your research group its culture will determine how others view you. And related to that, your outputs of your research group are directly tied to your brand, which is your promise of value, and your reputation. The culture is very important. We need to think about this from the very beginning, because the idea behind a research group's culture or a team's culture and how people view you is going to determine how others will decide, whether or not others will decide to even work with you or whether students and postdocs will approach you to work for you as, their, as your protege. You want to make sure that you have consistently and overtly made sure and communicated and clarified to everyone that the brand, the promise of value of the research group itself, is to help build success for everyone who is a part of it. It's not just your vehicle for success, but it's the vehicle of everyone's success. And when you do that, you attract stars. When you build a culture where people know that they can be successful and that it's open and people communicate and everybody's communicating and you get honest feedback in not in a in a in a inappropriate way, not in an offensive way, but in an in a constructive way that can help you to succeed, then as a student or as a postdoc or as a staff member, then what happens is that spreads. That's part becomes part of your reputation, this really positive culture that you've created. And that attracts stars. That attracts the new class of new students, new postdocs, new staff who want to be with you because they know they will be successful under your supervision. They know you that they will be successful in this environment. And so then that communicates outward about who you are as a scientist and it encourages other people who want to collaborate with you, not just as your protege, but as your equal, somebody who it would be on your uh, research team 
um, as a scientist who's already had their PhD, who already has their own research group. So related to this culture that you've built that's very positive and encourages accountability and encourages open communication and encourages success and inspires success and decreases risk and decreases safety concerns and decreases, uh, or not decreases, but make sure that there's, that if there's any safety issues that they are dealt with and that people do, people do feel safe in the group. And I'm going to get into more detail about that later. This then becomes tied to your reputation. And associated with that is how you will get more funding, how you will get more collaborations, how you will get more other hidden opportunities like the opportunities to serve on multinational committees or to win certain awards like the Nobel Prize or anything like that. So you have to remember that the culture is important. You set the tone for the culture. It will determine how other, others view you, how whether or not they determine to work with you either as your equal or as your subordinate. And your outputs of your research group, your papers, other publications, any media relations you do, um, any outreach you do, all the conferences that you attend, all the posters that you help to put together, any presentation that you do, anything that you do that connects you with the outward community and even beyond that, the outward publics, that is reflective of your brand and reputation. And so we want to make sure that there are always constant outputs that are the metrics of success in the industry that you want to be in. So in the industry of science, academic science, the metrics of success are related to publishing, presentations, funding, protégés, mentoring, things of that nature, service on committees, and so on and so forth. So those are the outputs that you need to be thinking about because those are the things that are going to move your career forward, your lab forward, your science forward, and quite frankly, your group and their, lab, their goals forward as well. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of running a research group because you know what? Surprise, surprise, you're actually running a business. You might not have thought of this before, and I'm sure your PI didn't tell you this, or maybe they did if they were thinking this way. But I know having studied mathematics, uh, you know, nowhere at any point in my career did somebody say to me, hey, uh, you know, Elena, guess what? When you graduate, when you go to graduate school, or when you decide to become a professor, guess what? You'll be running a business. Nobody said that to me. They didn't give me any knowledge of that. I had to figure that out on my own, that really when you become a professor, and quite frankly, as a postdoc, as a graduate student, you're part of a business, you'll be running a business. Your lab, your research group is a business. How is it a business? Well, you have customers. Who are those customers? Whoever pays you is your customer. So your customer include your customers include your department, your institution, your funding agencies, if a high net worth donor has donated money for lab support or for, uh, for any type of financial support or, or in-kind support of, of equipment or instrumentation, they are your customer too. You're producing a product. What is the product that you're producing? The product, as we talked about earlier, is the product that is tied to the metrics of success for your industry. Therefore, the product is your papers, your presentations, your grants that you get. Uh, and Related to that, your services are the service that you do, the service in serving on committees, the service that you do in outreach, and quite frankly, the service that you do in mentoring protégés to help them build their careers in science. You have multiple stakeholders, which include your collaborators, your uh, PI, if you have a co-PI, or if you have somebody who's working above you. Uh, you have your granting agencies, you have your department and institution, you know what? Your association, your professional association, such as AGU, serves as, as a stakeholder as well. You have to be accountable to those two. You have budgeting, accounting, and finance issues that you have to take, in, to take control of and to be aware of. You have sales and marketing tasks that you have to accomplish. What are those sales and marketing? I know it's shocking to hear. Oh my goodness, I went into science, Elena, because I didn't want to be in sales, because I didn't want to be in marketing. I'm a scientist. I don't have to deal with sales and marketing. Well, guess what? When you write a grant proposal, you are writing a marketing document. When you give a poster, when you give a talk, when you write a paper, you are writing a marketing and a sales document. Those are all part of sales and marketing. It's just you're telling the community what it is that you've done, how it is that this is important. That is sales and marketing. You're dealing with safety and risk management, and the risk that we're dealing with could be risk of, of actual uh, money, it could be mitigating risk associated with uh, human uh, concerns, such as like you know people getting hurt or people getting uh, ill 
from from using lab equipment or from being you know in a lab environment. Um, it could be risk associated with the actual project. So you're involved with all sorts of these safety and risk management issues. You have vendor relations tasks that you have to deal with because, of course, you're going to be buying equipment. You're going to be buying products coming down even to paper and printers, but you're also going to be buying huge pieces of equipment as well as you know, minor equipment like you know, desks and computers and things like that. So you have to interact with your vendors. You have to be in aware of and in charge of inventory and supply chain management. In other words, how do the supplies get into your lab? How do we keep track of those supplies to make sure that nobody's stealing the staplers or the post-it notes? Uh, how do we keep track and make sure, especially for high impact inventory, right? If you're a biologist and you have inventory associated with viruses, there are very, very specific risk protocols in place that have to be in place associated with the supply chain to make sure that you know exactly when and where anybody checks out a virus, right? If they check out a sample of Ebola, you have to know that happened, who did that, when they did it, how much they took, what they did it for, what they used it for, and when they put it back. So that's just an issue. Of course, even within geology, even with geosciences, we have to deal with inventory and supply chain management. I was just uh, speaking at the University of Texas Jackson School of Geosciences where I got a wonderful tour of their rock cutting laboratory. And even within that laboratory, they have to deal with supply chain issues. Whose rocks are coming in? Whose samples are coming in? What, how do the samples need to be processed? Who is actually going to do the processing? How is the processing going to be com communicated to the potential, to the, to the client, to the person who's bringing in the, the samples that need to be processed and, and cut? Uh, who's going to be there to make sure that there's the, the safety protocols are being followed? What is the chain of management in terms of if there is a problem, if there is a safety issue, who do we go to? Even within a rock cutting laboratory, these things have to be taken, taken very, very seriously. And then finally, there's also hiring and training. You're going to be hiring staff, you're going to be hiring postdocs, students. Some of them will be working for you for actual pay. Some students, for example, undergraduates, might be working for you for credit. They might be doing a, a short-term volunteer project within your lab, but they are still part of your subordinates. They are still part of your staff, quote unquote. So you have to have a way of hiring them and training them, and quite frankly, getting rid of them if they are not supporting your goals, if they are you know, injecting toxicity into the environment, or if they are not being productive for whatever reason. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. So this is a business. So let's treat this as seriously as we would any other business that we would be doing. So when we're managing a research group, we're thinking about the following three structures. We're managing projects, we're managing money, and we're not managing people. I'm going to tell you why in a moment. We're leading people. So managing projects, managing money, and leading people. Those are the three key things that we're going to be thinking about as we're managing a research group. So I want to talk to you a little bit about leadership, give you some definitions. I want you to start thinking about how you could be an effective leader. What would be your effective leadership style? It might be that you have a different style now than you will in five years or in 10 years. Or you might incorporate multiple styles. Some people do that. But I want you to be thinking about leadership now because the earlier you do that, the better leader you will become and the more productive your team will be and the happier they will be, and the happier they will be, the more productive they will be, and so on and so on and so forth. So Stephen Covey, who is a well-known leadership guru, describes leadership in this way. Communicating to people, and I actually would rephrase that. I'd say communicating with people. But communicating to people their worth and potential, so their, in other words, their value, what their skills are, what their abilities are, and their potential to be even more successful based on that value, so clearly that they are inspired to see it in themselves. So leadership, based on this definition, is a choice, not a position, whereas a management role is more of a position, right? I, I, I'm hiring you to be a manager. I'm hiring you to be a research group manager. Instead, I want you to think about, instead of being a manager, being a leader, okay? I'm going to lead by choice. And when we lead by choice, what we do is we're looking to inspire trust amongst our team members and our constituents. Clarify purpose. Clarifying purpose is so important. We need to be always communicating 
what the goal of the research group is, what your individual goals are, what the group's goals are, what we're trying to do overall, and how that relates to larger issues, like at the issue of what, how can we move our field forward. We need to align the system, actually align the systems, so that there's no conflict between what you say is important and what you measure to be important, and we're going to empower others to unleash their talents. And that's where having that really great research group reputation comes in handy because then you're able to attract really high quality talent. They come to you, they want to work with you, and then you can unleash them. And this is where you get Nobel Prize winning projects. This is where you get Nobel Prize winning innovations because you as a leader have inspired others to trust you, to pursue their own goals that are relevant and aligned with the goals of the organization, and you're unleashing on them that allowing them to use their talent the best way they know possible. Unleash it, allow, empowering them to be successful. So we're going to think about the idea that Peter Drucker, another speaker, talks about is that one does not manage people. The task is to lead people and the goal is to make productive the specific strengths and knowledge of every individual. So every individual matters within the organization. So a couple of thoughts on management versus leadership and on becoming a leader from Warren Venice. So think about this. These are actually things that I've thought about for myself as I've managed teams, as I've led groups of people. The manager typically administers, the leader innovates. So the leader looks to solve problems in new ways, and in doing so, they enlist their team to help them do that. Because quite honestly, you as the leader of a group, you do not have all the answers. That's why you must surround yourself with really high quality, talented people. And quite frankly, an undergraduate, a graduate student, a postdoc, no matter where they are in their career, they can contribute to your team in some way. And that's what the leader think it's, thinks about. They think about not just staying the same, which is what the manager does, right? The manager is a copy, the leader is an original. The manager maintains, the leader develops. So you are not looking to just maintain and keep the status quo, you're looking to innovate. You're looking to solve problems in novel ways. So you need people who think that way. You need people who want to think that way and want to learn how they can even think that way better. The manager focuses on systems and structures. That's where the administration comes from. But the, the leader focuses on people. How can I unleash that talent? You know, I see that this particular uh, person who works for me is really good on social media. Maybe I can utilize that to build a social media campaign, maybe a GoFundMe campaign for this particular research. Or maybe I can work with this particular student who knows a lot about social media to build a campaign to better communicate our science to new publics. Maybe we can create a, a webinar series or a podcast series about this area of geoscience or this area of science or engineering to inspire new people to support us, to inspire new people to go into the subject, to inspire new people just to be inspired. Because just knowing about it can inspire people in their own fields. They don't have to be scientists. So we're going to focus on the people. We're going to focus on their talents. We're going to, the manager relies on control, right? You have to do this way. You have to do it that way. But the leader inspires trust. I know I'm going to set up expectations. I'm going to let you know what the goals are, but I'm going to trust that you, as my subordinate, will actually be able to be productive, be successful, contribute to these goals in your own way. The manager has a very short-range view, whereas the leader has a very long-range perspective. They're looking at it from the mountaintop as well as from the micron level. <clears throat> Excuse me. They want to see, the leader wants to see, how can we move this particular project forward now? How can we do it? What will happen in five years? What will happen in 10 years? What, what, how can I empower my group? How can I encourage my group? How can I cultivate my group to be even more successful in the long run? The manager asks how and when, but the leader asks what and why. Why should we do it this way? Elena, that's a great suggestion. Why should we do it that way? Tell me how we should do it. Not tell me how, but tell me why we should do it. What can we do? The manager has his or, her, his or her eye always on the bottom line, always thinking about the budget. And of course, your budget is very important, but that's not where the end is. The end is what your scientific outputs are. So the leader's eye is on the horizon. 
again, going back to that mountaintop view of looking about how we can harness everybody's talents to move this science into a new direction. The manager accepts the status quo, but the leader challenges it and encourages its staff. You're going to be encouraging your staff to challenge the status quo of science. That's very important. Otherwise, you will stall. Everything will become stymied. And the manager does things right, but the leader does the right thing. And I love that because it's true. The leader does the right thing. In other words, when you lead a team in the right way, you're actually doing the right thing to encourage people to be successful, to be productive, to, to achieve the goals of the organization, and to achieve the goals of their own individual careers. So a successfully managed team has a vision. Uh, that's what you see for your group. It's going to be solving a problem. That's the discovery and innovation. And quite frankly, your research group is going to be solving multiple problems of many, many magnitudes, right? There'll be small daily problems that you'll be solving, and there'll be large year-long or multi-year-long problems that you'll be solving. And that's, like I said, the discovery and the innovation side of science. You're going to have a brand, which is your promise of value. What is your value? What can you deliver? How are you going to deliver that to your community, to your field, to your department, to your institution, to your subordinates? You're going to have a plan. A successful managed team has a plan to fill that mission, that vision and mission, and deliver that value to the customers who will pay for it. And so in this case, the customers include the funding agencies, the customers include the field, your other colleagues around the world who are in your subfield of science or engineering, as well as the people who are interacting with you, your collaborators. And the successfully managed team is talented and understands their value and the important role they play. And this is very important. I, as an individual, as a member of your team, if you are leading my team, I need to know that I am there for a reason, that, that the team could not function without my input, without my role, and that I play a vital role in moving the science forward. If you instill that in me, you're going to get a lot out of me. You're going to get a lot of productivity out of me. You're going to get a lot of innovation and ideas out of me. You're going to get a lot of harmony out of me. This is what you want to do. Okay? So as you build your team, you want to start thinking about what kind of leader do you want to be? How hands-on do you want to be? And you can ask your mentors. You can go and talk to faculty members. You can observe people in groups to see how they interact with teams, their teams, you want to think about what kind of team do you want? Uh, you know, what is the makeup? What's the right makeup of staff, students, and postdocs? Uh, how many since people will be working on multiple projects? How many people can you actually support emotionally, physically, financially, spatial-wise? How many people can literally fit in the lab? Um, how many projects can you particularly manage at any given time? You know, as you're starting your career, you're probably not going to want to multiple, you know, multitask on a very large basis, right? You're not going to want to have 37 projects to begin with. You're not going to want to have 100 postdocs and 200 graduate students. You need to start small because you need to start having productivity. You need to have, have outputs that demonstrate that you're being productive, that you're being successful, and then you can build bigger projects. Then you can seek out bigger projects with bigger staff, numbers of staff. But since you are thinking towards the horizon, right, you're thinking long term, and you're thinking about working on multiple projects, you may also want to be thinking about not just the numbers of people that should be working in your lab or working in your group, but also their background, their education, their skills. You know, if you're working on a project that related to a certain area of geophysics, um, you might want people who have a civil engineering background because they might be able to contribute to a particular project that you are looking to get into. Or you might want people who have a background in physical oceanography because that's related to a project that you're going to be working on or, or a grant that you're going to be applying for. So thinking about what type of skill sets and education and background and experiences that your staff, your team will have early on is a really good lesson. And you know, quite frankly, you could just simply make up a list right now as you're beginning your career, as you're advancing in your career. At any given time in your career, you can have a list. And I really encourage you to keep this list of the types of skills that you're interested in having and as part of your team, and then correlate that. Actually write it down on a piece of paper or type it however way you want it, but write it down and then correlate it with the rest of the types of projects that you're interested in pursuing. So if you hear about a request for a proposal for, about, for a physical oceanography project, 
or a project that relates to the ecosystem of the sediments under the bottom of the ocean, right? At the bottom of the ocean, the sediments that are there, there's all sorts of action associated with the microbes down there. If you're interested in doing a project relating to that, so then you could even work back and think, well, if I was to go for that proposal, if I was to write a proposal, a grant proposal that's related to that request for proposals related to microbes at the bottom of the ocean, who would I need on my team? What type of research experiences would they have had to have? What types of skills would they have had to have? This is very useful. So you can actually start with the skills and then think about what skills, how those skills could help you find the projects or do the projects that you're interested in. And you can also do it in the reverse. What projects am I interested in? And therefore, what skills will I need to uh, look for and cultivate within my team? And then we're going to need to identify what your expectations are. You're going to hear me say that a lot, expectations, expectations, because different members of your team will have different abilities, and therefore there's going to be different expectations that you will have for them. Right? A postdoc who's very experienced in a lab environment, who's been working on instrument X or using uh, you know, this type of database, database Y, for many, many years, they're going to have a different productivity level. They're going to have a different productivity expectation for you than an undergrad who has never been in a, in a lab before, who has never worked on a real research project with other scientists before. So knowing what the different expectations you would have for different members of your team, depending on their level of expertise, is important for you to identify for yourself so that when you actually approach your team members and tell them what you expect from them, you'll be able to have a unified voice for them across the team members, and depending on whether they are a member of, you know, as you hire new people, it'll be unified in, in how you communicate with new freshmen, with new seniors, with people who are coming in for an internship, with graduate students and with postdocs. You also want to be thinking about, as you build your team, what kind of communication style or styles you will utilize for official group meetings, which you should be having on a regular basis, for informal discussions, how will you actually keep track of your informal discussions? We're going to talk more about that shortly. Uh, for internal presentations, you know, what are the expectations that um, if I'm going to be giving a talk to the members of my team and I am an undergraduate, what are, how will I, as the, if I'm the undergraduate and you're the PI, how have you told me that I, and the team that they can express feedback? How, how will I know that I'm getting the right information to advance? to do the right thing from you and from the team. So you want to understand, you want to figure out what would be right for you to utilize, what kind of communication styles. And also in interacting individually, one-on-one -on -one with team members. You know, I talk a little bit about this in other webinars that I've given about Donald Trump. So Donald Trump, one of the things that he's famous for is he loves and he cherishes five-minute meetings. So if you're going to have a meeting with Donald Trump, if you work with Donald Trump, or if you work for Donald Trump, or if you would like to work for Donald Trump, you better make sure that the meeting that you have with him lasts less than five minutes. Don't expect to give him a 30-minute overview or an hour and a half overview of the project, then asking his advice or asking for his contribution, because he'll kick your butt right out of the office. He wants five minutes or less. So if you can communicate the importance of your message and mission and what you're hoping to do in a collaboration with him in one minute, man, you've saved him four minutes, which knowing Donald Trump is probably $4 million. So you've actually done him a huge favor. So this is what you want to be thinking for yourself. How do you like to be communicated with? Do you prefer, if somebody's going to have a meeting with you, do you prefer to have all the facts in, emailed to you in advance, at least one day in advance? just so you can mull over them so that the meeting itself will be a little bit more quickly. It'll go, go by quickly. It'll be a little bit more productive. Or do you don't mind if people bring up new ideas right there on the spot, uh, you know, or, or don't necessarily give you the background information until you're actually in the meeting? These are things you want to be thinking about. And this will be your preference. And quite frankly, this is nimble because your communication styles will change depending on the individual, depending on the ecosystem, the system the department, the culture of the organization you're working for, and it will also change as you advance in your leadership abilities. You will develop new communication styles, you will learn about new communication styles and methodologies, which will help you to enhance your team and enhance your group and your projects. So as you hire 
and ensure the success of your group members, think about how many can you really lead and still be productive, and we're going to set protocols in place. The protocols that we set in place are very important because we need to be uniform, again, amongst all group members. We need to make sure that everybody knows what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. And this will allow us, this is a process. Protocols are an element of a process. They're, excuse me, the protocols are a process. They are a piece of the project management, which I'm going to show you in just a moment, that allow the project to be managed fruitfully, that allows the project to come to fruition, to actually come to a conclusion, and allows your team members to be productive. If people don't know how their, for example, how their progress is going to be evaluated, then and everybody's progress is being evaluated in a different way for whatever reason, then that could potentially create a breakdown or create a wall of productivity, and productivity will cease. So we need to put protocols in place. So what are these protocols? We need to put protocols in place about how projects are actually going to be managed. I'm going to talk to you more about that in a moment. The communication, we need to communicate expectations of individuals, expectations of the group, and the responsibilities of the group and the individuals. And those responsibilities range from actually doing the science, conducting the scientific research, and contributing to this particular project or this particular paper or this particular type of, of, of scientific discovery to the responsibilities of their role in the group as it relates to the lab space. You know, you're responsible for making sure when you leave that the lights are off the computers are plugged out, you know, unplugged or whatever, that the data has been uploaded to a secure site or to a certain cloud, and that the security of the lab is in place, that there's a security system that you have made sure that that's secure. These are the responsibilities that you need to communicate and think about. You need to set protocols in place that allow for the training of individuals on equipment or in the processes, training of processes within the project management enterprise. You need to ensure and set protocols that ensure and evaluate progress. How am I going to determine that you're being successful? How, what are the metrics going to be that I'm going to evaluate you on? And when am I going to do that? How often am I going to have progress reports with you? How am I going to do it yearly? Am I going to do it by the semester? Am I going to do it quarterly? Um, I'm going to set protocols in place that, that demonstrate and show me and show the team that you're contributing to productivity. This is where communicating across the team is going to be so helpful using methods, using tools such as Google or other types of, of communication uh, software products that allows everybody to see what everybody's doing at any given time in terms of contributing to the productivity of the lab or the group is going to be very important. So that's an example of a protocol setting, making sure that everybody you know, uploads their lab notebooks or keeps their notes all in a central location so everybody can be aware of what everybody is doing and where they are on the, on the list of things to do for this project. We need to set protocols in place and how we're going to use lab equipment and how we're actually going to use the lab, right? I want to make sure that, you know, it's clear to my team that this place is not meant for little kids. So if you have a child, do not bring your child to the lab. It's dangerous. You know, don't, we're not going to have tours in this lab because there's danger associated with it. So we need to set protocols in place about how we're going to use the lab. We need to set protocols in place how we're going to use the lab equipment, the computers, right? I want to make sure that if you're on Facebook, you're doing it for the, the, the lab's benefit, right, the group's benefit. It's not just so that you can post those fabulous pictures of you getting wasted in Cabo. We want to make sure that we're using it for the right reasons. I want to set protocols in place that allow me and help me to hire and provide orientation for new people. And to do this, I can get help from my institution. I'm going to give you some resources at the end of this webinar. I also, quite frankly, have to set in protocols in place that will allow me to fire and let go ineffective or potentially negative workers within my team. And, you know, that's a hard thing to do. And the first time you fire somebody is going to be very challenging for you, but it'll get easier. But frankly, the more you do integrate these protocols into your lab management and your research management and your research leadership, you will actually get better at it and you'll get so good at hiring people that the firing, there'll be less and less firing. You'll be, you want to stay connected with those who are successful and leave. In other words, as your graduate students graduate and go off 
as your postdocs leave and start their own labs, you want to set a protocol in place so that you can stay connected with them. Their success is your success and vice versa. So you want to make sure you continue that successful collaboration even after they leave. And then we also want to set protocols in place in general that minimize any potential risk to the research group environment, which could include spending too much money, could include personnel conflicts, and could include safety issues. So when we think about managing projects, these are some real, two really good resources for you. The Project Management Institute, PMI.org, and the Association for Project Management in the UK, APM.org.uk. Really great resources. Project management is not just some fluffy thing. It is a real subject. People get accredited in project management. There are classes. There are certificates. There are all sorts of professional development opportunities that you can pursue specifically in project management because it is a real thing. It is a real field that people put energy into to, and time and research into to see how they can better manage projects. And you know, the Institute, excuse me, the Project Management Institute has identified, I think, something like 33 individual processes that take a project from idea phase to production phase, approximately 33. Now, the APM, the Association for Project Management, identifies project management as the application of processes, methods, knowledge, skills, and experience to achieve the project objectives. So it's the application of processes, methods, knowledge and skills and experience. You see of those five things, processes, methods, knowledge, skills and experience, four of those five things are dependent on your team. They are all, the, four of those are dependent on your team. The processes are dependent on the team as well, but they're mostly gonna be processes that you put in place and the team is going to act, upon, according, act upon and act according to those processes. But the methodologies, the knowledge, the skills, and experience are coming from your team. So you see how closely related team management and project management are. With managing project, goal setting is the key. We're going to identify and articulate from the beginning what our expectations are, and we're going to communicate to our team why this is important, how it helps the team's mission, and what their individual unique contributions do to contribute to that mission as well. The core components of project management as identified by the Association for Project Management. You can take a look at this online. I pulled it right from their website. And this, of course, is going to, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the AGU Career Center site shortly. So you can take a look at this. But I just want to draw your attention to a few of these components because I want you to be thinking about them as you manage projects, as you develop your own communication style, and as you develop your own project management style. We need to define the reason why a project is even necessary. Yeah, that's the goal of the project, obviously. We need to capture and identify the project requirements, including the quality of deliverables and the quantity, the esti and estimate resources and time scales, right? That's also about time management and budgeting. We need to prepare a business case to justify the invest investment, aka we need to write grants, right? We need to write proposals to support this. And the proposals could be to granting agencies or it could be a proposal to our department chair to ask for a larger lab, right? And then so we have to present the business case, the case for the science, why this will help the science, why this will help the department, why this will help the institution to justify that investment that they're, that they're providing. We need to secure what I call corporate agreement, that's the institutional agreement, as well as funding within the institution and outside. We need to develop and implement a management plan for the project, in other words, what are the individual phases of the project and how will they actually be delivered. Then we need to lead and motivate the team. We need to manage the risks and the changes on the project. We need to monitor progress as we've talked about it as according to the plan that we have set up. Manage that project budget. Maintain communications with the project team and the stakeholders and close the project. In other words, actually produce something, the output, the paper, the presentation, the proposal, whatever it is, close that project in a controlled fashion when appropriate. So these are the basic core components of any project manager. Now coming to the core of the core components is the communication, right? So we're going to, and I've been talking to you about that. I've been communicating with that, with, about that issue with you today. And so what I want to do right now is communicate with you about how you communicate with your team, okay? Now, note, 
there are certain information that you absolutely need to tell your team, and then there are certain information that you want to inspire the team to contribute to. So an example of what you need to tell the team is you need to tell the team the mission of the group, the mission of the lab. You need to tell the team what are the goals and the expectations of the lab. You need to tell the team how the project's progress and their progress will be metricized, how metricized, if that's even a word, if, how it will be analyzed, how it will, how it will be identified, and how it will be shared. That's you. That's on you. Now, the tasks of the group to accomplish these goals and to look forward to pro progress, those tasks can be identified by both you and the team. In fact, if you work together as a team to identify who would be best to work on those tasks based on their background, their skills, their experience, again, you're unleashing their talent, you're showing them that they are considered to be a member of this group, that it's not just you pointing your finger and telling them what they have to do, they are empowered to figure out what they need to do, this makes a stronger team. And then ultimately, the delegation of the tasks is going to be you and the team. Right? You have the authority. The buck stops with you. So you do get a chance to say to Jane, all right, Jane, that's a great idea. Why don't you take that on? Okay, Jim, that's a great idea. That's your job. Why don't you do that? So the delegation of the tasks, which will be identified based on your team communication between you and your team members, the delegation is going to come from you, but it's quite honestly also going to come from the team itself. So the team is going to help decide who should be doing things. And those tasks that are going to be delegating and how they're going to be delegated and to whom they're going to be delegated is going to be based on the immediate needs and deadlines, such as if there's a paper or a proposal, a short window to take data, as well as your knowledge of your group member's skills, abilities, and don't forget about their own career interests, right? We're giving back, we're mentoring the next generation, so we have to always be thinking about that as we build our team, as we communicate our, with our team. Okay, Elena, I know you are really interested in working on the social media aspect of this, um, but you haven't done much social media. Why don't you and Paul work together? Since I know Paul has experience with social media, you and Paul can work together on this project. So now Elena and Paul are working on the project. Elena is going to learn social media from Paul. Paul has, the, has been given the task of not only leading this team relating to social or leading the subgroup relating to social media as it relates to the project, but helping Elena to bolster her skills in social media so everybody wins, okay? As we communicate with our team, we're going to have scheduled meetings to keep track of everyone's progress. We're going to make sure we have a central database where everyone can see what everybody's working on. And an example could be an online lab notebook or a Google spreadsheet. You know, I've talked with many, many groups that have been successful in many, many different areas of science and engineering and math. And almost always what I'm hearing lately is Google spreadsheets, Google, Google, Google. In other words, all of those free resources, those tools that Google offers, you know, to keep track of things, including scheduling schedules, uh, where people can log on and see what's happening in real time, very, very useful. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on these types of databases. You can you just use the free tools that are provided if they work for your team. But you do need it, and you do need something that everybody can contribute to, and people can see that they're contributing, you know, making notes and changes, and they can see who's made those changes and when they made those changes. You want to set clear expectations about what members of the team should do if they have a problem that they can't solve, right? How can the, 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 the goal of this is if we have, if Elena has a problem, you know, Doug, Doug's the team member, the team leader, Doug, you know, we have this thing, we can't seem to get past it. It's a stumbling block. What should we do? Well, maybe the expectation is that we all will come together for a short meeting to figure out and spitball ideas as to how we could get over that hump. So we also need to ensure, this is very important, should not be taken lightly, that the group feels safe, that they're not in physical harm from any of the instrumentation, any radiation, any, any live viruses, any animals or anything like that that are in the lab, um, or in the when you're taking data out in the field, right? I need to make sure that if I'm taking data with a group out on the ocean, that they're not going to be in physical harm. So I need to make sure that there are safety protocols in place, even if it's not within the confines of my lab group, of my physical space. If my team members are going to be on a, on a vessel, 
or if my team members are going to be out in the field or in another country or a region where I'm not necessarily going to be the one in charge, I need to make sure that they are not going to be in physical harm in any sort of way. This will help the team succeed, of course, if they know that they're not in physical harm. And they also need to know that they can come to you personally with concerns, that you will consider them serious, that you will take it, keep it confidential if it needs to be, and that they can come to you personally with conflicts, conflicts that might arise with other people in the group or people outside the group, and that you also will take it confidentially and consider a solution with them in mind, and if, if a third party needs to be brought in with them in mind as well, and that confidentiality will be maintained. Um, and you know, again, this idea of the group feeling safe, it's also very important. I didn't mention it explicitly here, but I'm going to say it here explicitly now. I need to know if I'm going to be a member of your group that I am safe from sexism, I am safe from racism, I am safe from comments, I am safe from any sort of harassment that could inhibit me as an individual that could harm me physically, mentally, emotionally, or career-wise. I need to know that I'm not going to be harassed. And if there is a protocol that you as the team leader have put in place, maybe in concert with the human resources division of your institution, which is a really wise choice to do to connect with the HR department, then they will feel safe. And you will know, everybody will know that this type of behavior, this type of comment, or this type of action is not to be tolerated, and it's a one-time only deal. You make a racist joke in my lab, you are gone. That's it. Be good by. Okay? So everybody feels safe and they can be more productive. Ultimately, your productivity and your reputation are on the line based on your entire team's projects and productivity. So we need to make sure that anything that is being said about your group is truthful and is in line with, with, with the, the, the productivity and the, the positiveness that you've created, right? The last thing you want to do is create an environment where everybody's conflicting, everybody's having fights, they're not coming to you with those fights, uh, the fights are being communicated outside the group, so people are, your reputation is being maligned because people are thinking that this is a group where you can come and you can get in a fight with somebody and not be held accountable, you know, or that people are not safe, that you can come here and you know that you'll be harassed, you'll be sexually harassed or, or whatever in any case, and it's okay with the lab manager because he or she is never there. This is going to impact your ability to get grants, to move your own career forward. So these things are not to be taken lightly, ever. We also, of course, have to manage our money, right? So we need to consider potentially getting some basic accounting or finance education. This could be as simple as maybe reading a book, taking an online course, taking a webinar, uh, or maybe even just taking a, a, a workshop that your institution offers um, or your, even your professional association might offer on basic accounting for research groups. Something as simple as that. You don't need to spend much time, even money on this, but it is important because this is the first time probably that you're going to be managing a business. So you have to have accounting processes in place. You need to know where your money is going, right? You need to know how to track your money. You know, if you suddenly see, if you have given your credit card, uh, the, the lab's credit card to an uh, undergraduate to go buy things from the bookstore, and suddenly on the lab credit card statement you see that there is a $300 charge for a computer that you did not, uh, you know, say was okay, that this is going to be a problem. And it's going to be a problem in the latter run, so we want to make sure we cut this off from the beginning to make sure you've set up these accounting procedures and processes so you can keep track of your money. Uh, what are your startup funds? Identify what your startup funds, when you can actually access them. In other words, if you're coming into a new department, when are you going to be able to access the startup's money? so that you can actually start building or renovating your lab space. And how long is that money going to last? Is there a deadline that you have to spend that money by, right? Sometimes they say you have to spend it within the, the academic year. Well, make sure you do that, right? Know the current funding landscape, both within the institution as well as within the science. Connect with your institutional's development director and their public relations director. That's the public information officer, or PIO, very soon once you get there, because you want to let them know and do first start, talk to your chair first, your department chair, let them know you're interested in doing this, and then you can connect with them. You want the development director, who is the chief fundraiser for your institution or your department or your, or your uh, college, as well as the PIO people who get the word out to the media, to let them know that you are on their side, that you want to help them in their projects. 
And by doing that, you're going to actually end up helping them to help you get money, get support, get financial support, and get media support for your projects. So we're going to invest in budgeting software to keep track of our money and accounting software. We're going to set expectations about grant writing, when, who's going to be writing it, what piece, when is it going to be done. We're going to know what we need to include in grants. We might not have thought of it before because we hadn't written large-scale grants. Maybe we've only written pieces of grants, right? But in large grants, we need to include money for people, money for travel, money for production of actual papers, and, and, and money to travel to conferences, professional development. There's something in NSF called the National Security, National Security, the National Science Foundation called broadening participation. That might be that's something where you have to demonstrate how your research is going to broaden participation and how you're going to allow for that. So you have to put that in the grants. You need to know how to manage the grants and who you're accountable to. And when you're negotiating, when you're managing your research space, which is also vitally important, please, I'm asking you, please, Elena is asking you. So if Elena is asking you, please do it. Negotiate. Negotiate for your lab and office space. In other words, don't just give what they get, don't just take what they've given you, but negotiate for it. Once you have that faculty position and the offer is in front of you, see if you can negotiate for a larger lab space, a larger startup package, a larger office space, um, maybe even furniture or equipment from other maybe retired faculty or, or from uh, um, resources that have been sitting in the basement of the, of the department for years and haven't been used, but you know you could potentially retool them and re-renovate them to be used. So know what your needs are. If you're going to negotiate, as you know, I've talked about negotiation. When you negotiate, you always have to know what your needs are. So know the amount of space that you actually need for your research group, for your lab. Know what kind of equipment and instrumentation you need and their footprint. What's a footprint? The footprint is the actual amount of space that the instrument takes up on the floor. So, you know, in other words, it takes up a two foot by two foot space. That might be better than something that takes up 12 foot by 12 foot, right? So it might be something if you have an instrument that you have three instruments where you can put them, stack them up vertically, this might be something useful for you to know because it will save you space, right? So knowing their footprint is very important. Knowing the costs, the maintenance issues and costs, the power needs, how much power does this particular instrument require? Does that require me to retrofit the entire lab? Uh, are there special needs for my research? Maybe I need to be on a higher floor. Maybe because I need minimal vibrations. Maybe I need extra security because there's animals or maybe there's issues associated with viruses or, or rocks, right? Or diamonds, right? You're dealing with diamonds, you're going to need some extra security. Don't just rely on a quick uh, key. Right? Know where, who has your keys, and, and in fact, if you have diamonds in your lab, you better make sure you have multiple doors with multiple entrances that require biometric data, such as veins and irises, to actually get into the lab. Uh, safety items. What safety items are you going to need? You're going to need vents, an eyewash statement, hood station, hoods, all sorts of different things. These are things that you can work with your facilities management to identify if you're not sure of. Of course, you're going to need office equipment, desks, chairs, phones, whiteboards. You're going to need your IT, your hardware, your software, and then access to potential server, special servers or larger computers or the cloud. And then you're going to need the actual physical space for your team, where they're going to work, how they're going to work um, the, for your team of expected students, postdoc, and technical staff. So the resources that you can call upon to find out all of this information, all these things that you need to know how you can figure out what your needs are for your research space, the resources include talking to your mentors, the PI that you have now. Have a conversation with him or her about how he or she figured out what their research resource needs were. Talk to your new department's faculty, their staff, especially the administrative staff, because they'll know about these things, the computer guy. Right, the IT guy in your new department, he is going to know what the needs are and what the resources they have are that are available. Talk to the new faculty resources in your institution. There's probably a new faculty resource center. It could be in under HR. It could be under another division. But talk to them. See what kind of resources they can provide you with information about what you might need and how you could go about getting it. Your institution's human resources is going to be an invaluable resource to you for information about hiring, training, firing staff, and also for information about professional development available to you and your group 
you know, want to continue that success, continue that successful development of skills, they can help you do that. Um, your facilities management is going to know about air issues, power issues, electricity issues, HVAC, all of those things, water issues. They're going to be able to point you in the right direction and tell you what your needs are, how you can access those needs, and what the resources are that are available. And then, of course, within your, the confines of the, your professional community, the geosciences community, the scientific community, and, of course, your professional association like AGU. So the lessons to be learned here are, number one, as you build your research group, as you build your research team, as you manage your research team, as you lead your research team, know who you are accountable to. Who is your boss? Who are your customers? Who are the people that you have to report to ultimately? And then remember that the group itself, the group that you assemble, no matter what they do, whether they do amazing productivity, production of amazing projects and products, or they crap out and they suck for some reason, the buck stops with you. Ultimately, you are held accountable. So you are accountable to other people, and your group is accountable to you, and you are accountable for your entire group productivity, which is why it is so important for you to create and cultivate a group culture that encourages innovation, collaboration, and open communication. You need to set and articulate those expectations for every aspect of managing the lab, the projects, the money, and leading the team. You need to communicate openly and share how your preferred communication methods can be utilized and what they are. You need to invest in professional development, in business, project management, finance, and even hiring and conflict resolution skill sets. And remember that every action that you take, every leadership decision that you make, you have a team of people who are watching you, your protégés, those students, those grad students, those postdocs, those staff, they're watching you. They're learning how to lead from you. You're setting an amazing example for them to take their leadership skills, learn how to be a leader, and move on to the next and build a legacy from you and build a legacy of your scientific outputs. So make sure that as you lead your team, you truly inspire them to be great and to inspire them to reach out and empower their teams to be just as great as well. This is a true power that you have, and it's something that can be very exciting as you go forward in building and managing your team and leading your team to success. So with that, I thank you so much. This has been always, it's always a true honor and a pleasure to address you and to work with AGU and their Career Center on these types of webinars. We're going to have more coming up in the fall. I wanted to invite you to join me on LinkedIn and on these various different places on Facebook and Twitter. And guess what? My book, Networking for Nerds, it's coming out. Yes, it's finally coming out. It'll be out on June 22nd. This is a book specifically for you. If you are a scientist, if you are an engineer, if you are a nerd like me, this is a book for you. And in fact, it's actually, uh, if you take a look on the Amazon page for this book, you'll see that um, there's been a number of endorsements, including endorsements from high-level members of your own professional society. So I thank you again for this opportunity. I know there's a few questions. I'm going to stick around to answer the questions. And if there's any other um, thoughts about um, anything else, we can, uh, we can go forward with those as well. So somebody asked a really great question. Would you recommend or would you recommend getting or would you recommend not getting or pursuing a formal MBA? Uh, could you discuss the positives and the negatives? I'm really glad you asked that question. A lot of people think about this as they advance in their scientific career, whether or not they should get formal business education. So, you know, a really, I have to draw, to, to answer this question, I have to draw on an article that I wrote. It was an interview with Elon Musk. So Elon Musk, as you know, has a, well, maybe you don't know, he has a physics background and he also studied economics at the University of Pennsylvania. And you know the name, Elon Musk, He's the guy who uh, co-founded PayPal and then went on to run SpaceX and Tesla. So he runs two major companies right now, and he's all over the news. And I interviewed him, and you can find that article on my website. I interviewed him, and I asked him about that subject. I asked him about whether or not formal business training is important, because he happened to drop something about it in the conversation. And I said, well, do you hire MBAs? Because uh, he had said that he doesn't think that MBA programs are good. He thinks that MBA programs... Whereas scientific programs teach people how to think, teach people how to innovate, he thinks that MBA programs think, 
teach people to not think. They teach people to shut down their thinking. So I said, well, Elon, do you, because I called him Elon, I said, hey, Elon, do you hire MBAs? And he said, well, I do hire MBAs in spite of their MBA. So I thought that was a very interesting statement. Now, I, uh, myself, have one of the things that I have done in my career is I ran at the University of Arizona. I oversaw a master's program that combined science and business. It was called the Professional Science Master's Program. You might want to look into these PSMs, Professional Science Master's Programs. They're all over the country. They're abroad and many other countries now, too. The idea is to prepare scientists for careers where they're involved more in business. And I've seen a lot of my PSM graduates and alumni take that PSM education where they're learning accounting and finance and project management and marketing in formal business settings and classes that are designed for scientists to learn business. They're taking that and they're using that to run research labs. So they actually become, that's one of the job paths that they have pursued getting the PSM is running research laboratories. So I think that business education for scientists is not a downside. I think that it can help you. I don't think you necessarily have to get an MBA unless you really want one. So the idea behind getting an MBA and getting any advanced degree is you have to ask yourself two questions anytime you want to think about any advanced degree. And this goes for a PhD too. If these two questions, if the answer in your mind to these two questions is yes, then you should go for that MBA. In this case study, we're talking about an MBA. More largely, we're talking about any advanced degree. Okay? So question number one, do I need the MBA for the job path or career path that I endeavor to get into? Do I need that degree? If the answer is yes, then chances are you probably want to get that MBA. Now, right now, to run a research group, to run a research of effective, successful research group, you do not need an MBA. You can take a few business courses, you can read a few business books, go to a couple of webinars, and I think that that would be enough. If you hunger for more business education, you can pursue other coursework. You can reach out to people and have informational interviews and informal conversations, and, and maybe take MOOCs, right, those huge, massive online courses online. They're all open now, and they're all free. So question number one, do I need the MBA for the job that I want? If, you, if your job is to be a scientist, and your job is to be run a research group, then the answer is no, you do not need an MBA. And the second question that you would need to ask yourself if you were deciding to go on for an MBA is, do I love, love, love this subject? So an MBA, you know, used to take two to three years. They've been able to winnow, winnow that down quite a bit. Some now, they have night MBAs. They have MBAs for working professionals. So you can get an MBA in 18 months, 12 months, maybe even shorter for some programs. But quite frankly, even in, if it's a 12-month MBA, you're still going to be spending a large amount of time doing business cases, solving business problems, working on business issues, on marketing, on accounting, on finance, on project management, on quality assurance, on all aspects, on safety, on, on supply chain and inventory and production and distribution questions. Now, if you love that kind of thing, if you love science and you love business, then go for it. If you really think that you would enjoy getting that MBA, while you're doing that MBA, you'd be actually having a good time, then the answer to your question, should I get the MBA, is yes. So if you've answered both those questions, do I need it for the job? Yes. And do I love, love, love this subject because I'm going to be immersed in it heavily for the next 12 or 18 months? Yes. Then the answer is yes, get the MBA. If the answer of only one of those questions is yes, I love this subject, but I really don't need it, then you can consider getting it. Or you can think about how you might get that information from another source because you might want to spend more time doing other things that would move your research group into productivity, right? Like hiring really talented scientists, thinking about new projects, uh, getting your own sci other scientific uh, and experimental skills honed, things like that. So there are pluses and minuses to getting the MBA, and it's all about your own personal choices your own personal career path, what you endeavor to do with your career path, and so on and so forth. So I can't say yes, I can't say no, but what I can say is think about those two questions. Do I love this enough to do it for the next 12 to 18 months, and will it get me the job that I want? And if both those are yes, then you can go. You should consider the MBA. If one of those is yes, you might want to consider not getting the MBA. 
So a couple of other questions came in. Um, let me see what which one we have here. Thank you for your questions, by the way. Um, is there any objective way to direct your career? I what I mean is I really like doing research, but I recognize that most opportunities for PhDs are in academia. Sometimes it is frightening to think about giving lectures when almost all of my training was about solving scientific problems. I guess what you're asking is how your question was, is there any objective way to direct your career? And really, great question. Uh, I've given lots of webinars on career development and career exploration. Check them out on my website, elenalevine.com. Check them out on AGU's Career Center website at careers.agu.org. Um, there's lots of things that you can do with your PhD beyond becoming a professor, beyond be becoming a lecturer. I'm going to save that for another day, but be aware that you have infinite possibilities. Um, so, and I think that's it in terms of the questions. So if you have other questions, please feel free and email them to me. And as usual, we'll be having a companion article that will accompany this webinar once it's posted. So thank you again, AGU Career Center, for supporting this endeavor. Thank you all for joining me today. It's been a true pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I really had a great time, as I always do, uh, working with you. Even if I can't hear you, I know you're out there laughing at my jokes, which are absolutely hilarious. So I look forward to seeing you and hearing you and knowing that your presence is there at our next webinar in the fall. And think about my book, Networking for Nerds. It's out June 22nd. It's my baby. I birthed it. It's three years, and it's going to be out, so I'm really excited about it. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day, and good, no good luck, but enjoy the adventure of running your next research group, because I know you're going to do it with finesse and success. Have a great day.